I started my career in Houston, in H-Town, uh, Texas. Just really um, looking for, like, kind of hustling, trying to find a representation. But there are a lot of scams out there. Um, so I ended up in one. And uh, it actually, you know, led me to my first acting coach. And I didn't ever stop training from there. I fell in love with the training. I fell in love with the, the art that was mine because my parent, my mom uh, had us in music and my whole family was like involved in music. And I, when I finally found something that could be my own where I could just like hone in and be by myself, go, you know, my mom would drop me off. I would be there all day just digging into characters and, and I fell in love with it. I had already kind of grown up trying to do impressions and stuff like that. Um, and people would always be like, do, 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 do Bill Clinton, do Tina Turner. And, and I was like, oh, people get paid to do characters? Absolutely, let's do this. So that's how I got into it. Well, I mean, the first was like through scams. <laughs> like through, um, there were like these agencies that would have you use their photographer and their classes and pay like thousands of dollars or, um, but you know, through that process, I found real people that were passionate about the work and led me to the right, um, classes and through the classes I got representation, proper representation and, um, and just continue to study and do my research. The first, first agency that I got, my mom told me, you know, if you want to do this, you got to find an agent. So she gave me a newspaper and I had to, I was 11 at the time, I had to flip through the newspaper, find an agent, call them. They called my mom back like, you know, your son called us and left a message like we just want to make sure this is okay she was like yeah it's fine so that's how i did it and then when i got to la i had to do a whole new hustle yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily call how to get away with murder one of my first appearances on tv because i had already been here working for like seven years something like that eight years um but uh it was a big step forward it was a big step j big jump in my career um to be able to work with viola davis who's incredible uh, as far as like playing a villain i didn't ever think of him as a villain um i don't think about any of my characters i don't judge my characters like that um i think if you play them as a villain or you think of them or you judge them as a villain then it becomes very like forced very like one note, very one-sided, not, not multi-dimensional as characters are. Uh, I, you know, thought of him as like a troubled, you know, uh, troubled dude who was trying to, trying to figure life out, you know, trying to figure out his place, trying to figure out, sort through his own trauma of being, you know, orphaned and adopted and all that kind of stuff. So, um, that, you know, it was, it was a really incredible experience and I learned so much from everybody but especially you know the queen Viola Davis well at the time um, I mean she's just incredible um, and a dope teacher learn you know uh, collaborator artist um, and, and she also was always super open to talk about activism, social justice stuff, and like how to advance black people forward. So I learned a lot. I learned a lot technically and, and socially and um, artistically from her. Um, but also it was like a historical moment where, uh, you know, she was this uh, dark, darker skinned black, uh, middle-aged woman um, on uh, leading a TV show where she was actually sexualized and intelligent and and um, has you know affluent in this period but she came from poverty and like th it was just so multi-dimensional um, as black care and more nuanced um, than you had seen someone uh, like her portrayed on TV before especially as the lead 
I mean, I have my favorite genres, right? I, I, I love magical realism. Magical realism is my top favorite. And then I love uh, murder mysteries. I try to figure them out before the movie ends, but I want no spoilers. I don't watch trailers to most movies. Um, I love thrillers, um, horror, but not like gory, like scare tactic, like cheap uh, horrors. I like, I like, you know, some story, some some real story behind it, you know, um, uh, characters, and you know, I like character-driven stories. I don't know. I like th those are probably the the my top. Other than humanity, not really. I mean, I've played uh, like a young like cadet or you know like a, a what were they called like a investigative trainee or something like that and then uh college students i played two college students but they were completely different and um the, the there has been a through line of names i've played nathan or nate probably five times i've actually asked people to change the name when i get another nathan or nate i'm like how many am i gonna play um but actually, uh, ghost. There's uh, one of them was ghosting. Ghosting on Freeform was a was a a, a TV movie, um, and and I had just finished Insecure when I booked that, uh, where everybody was calling me Ghost Bay because Nathan ghosted Issa, and I was like, I'm not gonna become a joke for the rest of my life playing Nathans that are a part of like a ghosting narrative. So I asked them to change my name. They changed it to Ben. Um, but other than that, like I played a British dude, I played somebody from Boston, I played, um, you know, this wealthy kid that ends up being a serial killer. I played poor, um, from, from Fort Worth, um, Texas. I, I played like, uh, I've been, I've been very privileged to play a, a, a wide range of characters. Um, and I think honestly that's just because uh, I don't necessarily fit in to like what's what or I will refuse to do stereotypical black roles if I feel like they're you know damaging to um, to our narratives um, and black life um, and then to be and then outside of that a lot of time uh, black people, they don't, they don't recognize the full spectrum of black people. Um, if they want a, a black person, traditionally they want like a stereotypical black person. So I would have to, I haven't ever until um, Insecure, haven't ever played a part that was written for me. Like written for my look. You know, it was always something. The first character I played was on Greek was supposed to be a Jewish kid. Um, you know, then there was this British guy. So there's like all, all these that weren't necessarily written for my look. Um, and so I, I just had to prove myself. Even Insecure, they didn't think that I, I would be able to play from Houston. They didn't know I was actually from Houston. So um, I've always had to prove myself in, in those situations and been grateful to do so. I think you know, definitely Denzel Washington, Lawrence Fishburne, um, Sidney Poitier. Uh, I, when I first got to LA, I joined a, um, a, a theater company called the Roby Theater Company that was named after Paul Robeson, and I didn't, I didn't know who Paul Robeson was at the time. So I've done a lot of research on Paul Robeson and how he used his platform and, and was a radical, dope activist, uh, as well as a brilliant uh, artist um, and actor. So uh, a lot of influence from that. Um, Alfre Woodard, Halle Berry, um, all those you know dope actors that came before me. Uh, incredible actors, Cecily Tyson and such. Um, especially the black actors, but there weren't a whole lot. Like I was, I was also looking at people like Robin Williams and uh, Brad Pitt and, and such growing up. Um, Daniel Day Lewis, you know, and, and they weren't always necessarily actors that I thought were the best or um, 
the best actors or whatever, but they had a work ethic um, and produced a, a certain type of work that I was like, you know what, that's, that's what I want to do with my, with my life. I don't know, probably anything with, I mean, when I was growing up, anything with Denzel Washington, anything with Will Smith. I grew up in the 90s, so. Yeah, Robin Williams, Jim Carrey. Um, I don't know about specific films. I mean, my, my taste was <laughs> developing at one point. I think my favorite movie in life was Deep Blue Sea, which uh, I probably wouldn't say now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I had a, I had a lot of, I liked Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte was one of my favorite films at one time. It got a lot of interesting, interesting choices, but it was usually actors that, that inspired me as opposed, uh, as opposed to films, but, um, but I've watched, I've watched way too many films to kind of decide which ones. I don't know. How acting influenced, I mean, it gave me a platform, right? Um, and I'm learning more and more, I'm, you know, that activism is like a spiritual thing. It's a, it's a metaphysical thing. It's a, um, a calling that I think we all have. Um, some people choose to answer that call, some people don't. Uh, but I think we're all here and our purpose in this life is to utilize whatever privilege we have, um, whatever pri privilege we can find to liberate folks, to liberate people that are most vulnerable um, and to seek them out, to seek out the most vulnerable and to liberate them, uh, utilizing whatever privilege we can find and working together you know, to do that in community. Um, and, and I find that a lot of liberators all over the country that I meet and all over the world are artists as well, um, or spiritual, like from some faith or whatever. And I think it's, it takes uh, that metaphysical part of you, leaning into that metaphysical part of you, um, in order to imagine better and see the world as different than it is. Um, and so I think the artistic side, the acting side, uh, the creative side, the filmmaking side, the storytelling side, uh, one allows me to connect and really empathize and feel uh, people's stories and want to relay those stories, to tell those stories over and over again, the important, the ones that I believe are really important that can, that can change people's hearts and minds um, and expose them to the truth. Um, but also uh, that artistic side allows me to connect with uh, the, 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 the future that we can't necessarily see, what is possible. Um, I can work to expand, I'm working to expand that imagination all the time so that my art can be better, but it also allows me to expand my view, my perspectives, challenge what I know, what I've been taught, um, um, and, 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 to, and to understand uh, that reality is not what we are told it is, um, that it is so much more, and that the possibilities are so much greater. Yeah, yeah, I mean, empathizing with any character, um, Again, you're taught not to judge them. Um, and, and in order to not judge them, you have to lean into them and, and assess why they make the decisions that they make and what would put you in that situation. What would make you, because a lot of actors get in there and they're like, I wouldn't ever do this. And it's like, what you should be saying is what would lead me to do this? Because anything's possible. You don't know until you're put in that situation. So I learn from every one of my characters and empathizing with anyone you can learn. Um, but with my character specifically and living in their shoes for a little bit, I always pick up some new trait 
or like if I made fun of something of the character or whatever, or like had a, a inflection in their accent or something like that, it stays with me for a little while in those ways, but also just things like life lessons that I learned. I don't know when it first became important to me. I mean, I've always had some inkling that, you know, I used to look at Malcolm X and and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and, you know, the people that we were taught about in school uh, and want to dig in further. And even wa watching like Roots and such, that, they, there weren't real resolutions to those stories and, and real justice, right? And so I was, I was always thinking, well, I mean, I guess we have to continue this work. Like, why aren't we still marching? I guess at some point, I'm, I, and I thought, you know, Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X and, and some of these folks were so much older, Coretta Scott King, I thought they were like way older than they, than, um, than they actually were when they started. They were like in their 20s, right? I felt like at some point in everyone's life, they have to, they just have to participate in, in that in a movement they have to um, I realized as I got older that that wasn't necessarily true um, that you will be called to but not everybody answers that call uh, but um, you know I, I always f did my best to find a way to get to the root of problems always I was always like the mediator or the you know, somebody, I would try to find, you know, when a teacher was racist, uh, uh, which they were, <laughs> um, I would go to the principal's office, try to get people to sign, you know, letters saying, you know, corroborating it or um, get a bunch of students together or try to put petitions together. But it wasn't, I didn't see it as activism. I saw it more as like, this is how we solve a problem. This is, you know, how we get to the root of it. Um, and... You know, then I went into art, so my first script that I wrote in 2007 was based on some brutality, police brutality that I experienced. And then I realized it takes so long to get films made and sell films and, and do anything uh, in filmmaking. And so I tried to do it through um, working with the population out here that is experiencing homelessness on Skid Row. Um, and then I realized that even the homeless shelters and philanthropy are just band-aids and how do I get to the root of it? And I was always just seeking like, how do I get to the root of this? Um, there's so much, pro the, a lot of the problems are mental health issues and, and poverty and that is criminalized. And why is it criminalized? There's, people shouldn't be living like this when we have abundant resources. Um, and, uh, and finally I was led to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement after, you know, Trayvon Martin and the Dream Defenders and such uh, inspired um, this new movement. And then finally the Black Lives Matter movement knocked on our front doors and there were people in L.A. I found out there was a chapter in L.A. 2015. Uh, and, and that's when I finally got into the grassroots activism phase. I had like artistic stuff that I tried to do before and, and philanthropy. But when I finally found that the grassroots uh, phase of my activism was through Black Lives Matter Los Angeles 2015. Yeah. Started going to police commission meetings and protests and, um, you know, yelling at cops and shit. Yeah, so uh, Build Power is a nonprofit initiative uh, that uplifts social, radical social change, like, you know, connecting Hollywood to. Um, leaders all over the country, abolitionists and, um, and, and those who are fighting for the most intersectional uh, change that are doing the real work on the ground um, and environmental justice, um, reproductive justice, gender justice and um, abolishing police and prisons and just making sure that we are um, working, organizing Hollywood to change the culture in Hollywood because the culture in Hollywood is oppressive. Um, I don't, I can't say that a specific event um, inspired it as much as 
my journey into activism and, and knowing that I was really, I was really desperately trying to find mentors in that area to, to hone in my activism and figure out where my, where my place was and how to best to use my platform. And I didn't really get to find that um, in Hollywood. And so I, I honed mine through other grassroots activists, but I realized that a lot of Hollywood folks aren't willing to do that. Um, and so, and, and through a lot of trial and error. So I wanted to help people avoid those pitfalls of trial and error. And more, more, more importantly, um, during that trial and error that a lot of celebrities go through, they go through that publicly and it's damaging to their careers, but even more important, it's damaging to the movement. A lot of the time they go on a red carpet and say a, a quote and it really fucks up the work of the people that are doing the, the work on the ground, the movement, right? Um, and so I wanted to prevent as much of that as possible and organize Hollywood in a real way, help organize Hollywood in a real way um, to change the culture and not just put band-aids, not just put like diversity initiatives and, and try to put black faces in, in, in um, we say black faces in high places, but actually change the, the culture ideologically. Like, um, um, move us away from like capitalism towards like liberation to away from anti-blackness and indigenous invisibility and such into um real liberation for folks um and 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 you know we were having some success in that but you know it's a very challenging challenging uh thing to organize to shift culture um but I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot through that process and a lot of people are more open to it now. I mean, we've collaborated for a while because they've been, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles has kind of been my political home for a long time. Now I've ventured into other uh, forms of activism um, or issues, uh, you know, um, realizing the connection between brutality, state violence or whatever, and immigration or um, environmental justice like you saw in Standing Rock. Um, and so we've done a lot but uh, and, and covered a lot, but um, Black Lives Matter has always been there. They've always been one of my, well, M Dr. Melina Abdullah and Patrice Cullors, who are bo both on our board, um, have always been advisors to me um, and therefore build power as well. Uh, but Mike De La Rocha and Tia Osho um, both have extensive history in, in, um, in many different types of activism and gender justice and, uh, you know, Black Alliance for Just Immigration and Black Lives Matter, but also Schools Not Prisons and uh, Fabi uh, Rodriguez, who's uh, our, um, one of our board members as well, is, is an incredible environmental justice activist, intersectional. Um, and so, you know, we've got a, a, a wide range of folks um, with extensive experience, but uh, just recently in the past uh, few months, we've been partnering with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, one, to amplify the amazing work that they're doing, the transformative work that they're doing here in Los Angeles, uh, but also to address uh, the defund the police movement and, and, and educate people on it and um, co-organize some demonstrations together always led by, by, by the folks that are doing, doing it, right? So, um, you know, we're learning from them still, you know, but uh, we've taken the things that we've learned from a lot of folks all over the country and um, applied it. So, you know, we've been co-organizing some demonstrations and also just uplifting, um, putting pressure on the city council, on Mayor Garcetti um, and all of the BS that they're they're doing, but it, it seems to be paying off at least a little bit. We're getting their attention. Um, and certain members like Herb Wesson and Nuri Martinez are actually uh, answering the call to, to, to make some change. Um, and it's very odd to be named in some of this change uh, as for the nonprofit initiative and myself, but um, I, there would not be uh, I, there, there would not be an opportunity to do so. Like Herb uh, always says, you know, that this motion to um, now the city council is, is, is considering a motion in the next couple of days to 
uh, direct all nonviolent calls away from police, which is huge because, you know, uh, violent, the, the calls for violent crimes that they get are probably make up one to five percent of the calls that they make. Um, and there are other things that they're considering as well. And Herb Wesson will, um, the council member will say, you know, name Melina Abdullah and uh, Jasmine Kanick and Kendrick Sampson and Build Power and Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. And to be, I don't think people understand what it feels like to even have your name named in, in motions like that. Um, also, when you don't feel like you deserve it because the 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 work has always been led by the community by you know folks like Joseph, folks like Baba Keely, and um, Jan and 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 Dr. Melina Abdullah, who all have jobs. Jan is a bus driver. Dr. Melina Abdullah is a doctor. No, she's uh, she's a professor. Um, you know, all of them have jobs and volunteer and have been doing this work every day. I was just included. Like they were like, you know, come along on the ride. Can I amplify this for you? Educate me so that I can pass this off. Um, so, but it's incredible to even be a small part of that change. Um, and I, I want everybody to be able to feel that. So I, I'm, that's why I'm like so adamant about bringing people on to this um, because the more people that are involved, the more people that are amplifying this and utilizing their platforms, no matter how big or small, the more chance we have to make this change a reality. We're at a, a tipping point where we actually can change America um, in an unprecedented way. Voting wasn't ever a system that was made for black people. Um, it, we weren't included in that process. We weren't, like our ancestors weren't included in that process. And and informing um, the system of voting, right? So it is a colonized system that was built on stolen and indigenous st stolen indigenous land. Uh, and so um, it, it it's excluding us in the way that it always has. Anytime we have wins in voting, it wasn't like some white president was all of a sudden like, you know, y'all, you guys are right. Or, you know, the, the people at the voting booth um, uh, just decided to help us out. We hijacked the system. Our ancestors actually hijacked the system and forced the hand of those who um, were working against us. Um, and, and so that's what we're, have, we're looking at now is how do we hijack the system and how do they continue to uh, 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 strengthen the obstacles against us um, to participate in a system that we weren't ever intended to participate in? Um, and so shorter answer is we need a new system. Yeah, I, I've, I've been developing projects for 13 years now that I've wanted to do so. Um, you know, I've taken, I haven't had a whole lot of time to be honest, but uh, I'm doing my best to push those projects right now. Um, they're all, you know, projects that I hope will shift culture um, and, and really, you know, expand people's imagination um, and honor the humanity of black folks or people of, of color in general. They're not all uh, centered around black folks, but many of them are. Uh, and uh, I hired my first um, writer, really dope uh, activist and writer um, named Taylor, uh, and, um, and have been developing projects with other folks. But the, you know, that's been an ongoing process for a long time. As we said, as I said earlier, it takes forever to make these uh, to make films um, and television and go through development and, and selling the project and everything. So uh, just really u using this time to, you know, I, I really believe that there is no liberation without art, right? Uh, that's a, a saying that we hear a lot in, in, in the movement. Um, uh, there is no revolution without art, excuse me. Uh, and so I, I think that, not I think, I know uh, 
that that is part of my duty as well, is to create art that, that pushes the revolution forward um, and really changes, changes culture. So uh, that's my responsibility and I'm sticking to it and, and, and I'm excited about the possibilities um, that are coming my way.